I am Joseph P. Sanchez, historian. For years I worked with the National Park Service and the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, and I direct the Spanish Colonial Research Center at the University of New Mexico, in which we deal with Spanish colonial documentation, and we also work with the authentication of trails across the United States. When we take a look at Spanish colonial trails, we're not just looking at one trail, we're looking at a myriad of trails across the country. One of the most important things to know about trails is that basically they are forged from Native American trails in which there were pathways along different corridors, such as a valley, for example, a river valley, or through a canyon, rarely over mountains. So when you take a look at a Native American pathway, it basically is a foot trail, and they're very careful about where they will, where they will be stepping. When you take a look at the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, you take a look at perhaps a trail that leads from Mexico City to a Spanish capital. And in that begins the legal definition of what a Camino Real is. But as you take a look at this particular map, you will see from south to north Mexico City running across the central corridor of Mexico. And the central corridor is filmed by two mountain ranges, the Sierra Madre Occidental, that is the mountain mama from the west, and the Sierra Madre Oriental, which is another mountain range on the east side, which is the mountain mama, the Sierra Madre Oriental. And both of these border pretty much the central corridor of Mexico. As you run across the corridor, uh, which is a very important word to use rather than a single line of march, we begin to see that the corridor is formed by many, many trails. When you take a look, for example, at this particular map, and you look down south in Mexico City, you begin to see that the first part of the Camino Real was forged in 1540 from Mexico City to Querétaro and Guanajuato, where silver mines were located. So basically, it was silver that drove that first line. But the first Camino Real from Mexico City was from the west coast, from the east coast rather, from Veracruz uh, to Mexico, uh, which Coronado himself had forged. That's the Camino Real de Veracruz. Another Camino Real ran from Mexico City to Acapulco, which uh, basically was used to bring cargo in from the Philippines. Once the ships landed at Acapulco, then the trail was used as a, as a trail of burden uh, where mules, for example, or carretas would, would be coming up and bringing stuff from, from, the middle, from the Middle East, actually, and from the Orient uh, to Mexico City. Uh, the other trail ran south, ran south from Mexico City down to Guatemala. And when you take a look at those particular trails, you begin to see that there is the fourth trail, which is the longest trail. It is the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, which ran between the two mountain ranges which I have uh, described. The Camino Real de Tierra Adentro runs from the year basically 1540 to Querétaro and Guanajuato. Uh, then by the, by the 15, 1550s, 1560s, another silver mine is, uh, mining area is discovered right around Zacatecas, and the trail extends all the way north to Zacatecas to about the middle of the map there. And as we move northward, we began to uh, pass uh, north into the area of uh, Casas Grandes, and just, to, just slightly to the, um, to the west of there is the Camino Real moving northward toward El Paso. The segment from the Camino Real de, de Tierra Adentro from, um, from about Zacatecas to El Paso uh, is forged, is run by Juan de Oñate. It is the first time the trail is run on a straight line north. The Camino Real is much more than just a straight line. As you can see by looking at this map, you see the straight line and you say, oh, that's it. We have the straight line of the Camino Real, but when you take a look at the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro historically, you begin to see that there is a 16th century Camino Real, a one single line that runs from, from Mexico City to Guanajuato to Zacatecas and probably as far north as Santa Barbara in, in Chihuahua. And you take a look at that single line again and you take a look at it in the 17th century and you begin to see something else has happened. The Spaniards have discovered more mining areas, they have set up ranches, they have set up farms, they have set up haciendas, they have set up missions, and they've done one other thing. They have set up military garrisons along the way to protect the road. So now the Camino Real begins to form another line which moves a little bit to the west, a little bit to the right, kind of zigzagging on the original line. 
When you get to the 18th century, you find another line as more towns, more forts and fortifications, presidios are put up along the way to protect the route. And you begin to see that the Camino Real de Terra Dentro not only runs from Mexico City with a myriad of villages, haciendas, towns, farms, ranches, mines, missions, anything you can think of that would settle along that particular line all the way north to New Mexico to its first capital established by Juan de Uñate in 1598 at San Juan de los Caballeros, which is near San Juan Pueblo. In 1599, the capital moved maybe about half a mile, uh, half a mile to the west, and it moved toward a direction uh, in which the uh, village of San Gabriel became the capital of New Mexico. So San Juan de los Caballeros, the first capital in 1598. By 1598, you have San Gabriel, the second capital. And then the capital of New Mexico moved south uh, and a little bit to the east toward Santa Fe and Santa Fe is established in 1610. It's important to note that the Camino Real is moving from Mexico City, the main capital, northward to different capitals at Durango, at uh, Torreon, at Zacatecas, at Santa Barbara. These are capital towns and these are t cities or towns that have town charters. The charters are very important because they describe that this is a very important city and it is the capital of that particular region. Santa Fe becomes the capital of the Provincia de Nuevo Mexico and becomes the capital in such a way that it is the royal capital of the far north. So as you take a look at the Camino Real, that single line that you see on the map, it's much more complicated. It is a braided trail for the 16th century villages to 17th century villages and towns to 18th century villages, towns, mines, fortifications, haciendas, and anything you can think of along the route. But it's also important to note about that thin line that you see on the map. It's not just as simple as a thin line moving up. As I said, these lines are created from Indian trails and Indian passageways. And as you take a look at the foot trails by the Indians, it's one thing. But when you take a look at something else, those of you who have ridden horses know that the horse isn't going to go where the man foot trail has gone. So you have to move the trail over a little bit more. Then all of a sudden you come up with a carreta and the carreta of the cart. You have a caravan of maybe 80 carts at a single time carrying supplies. You know they're not going to go where the horse went. They have to go a little bit to a flatter side of land and they have to find a slightly different pattern of how to form that particular road. Then you get to the 20th century and you have the automobile. Now you're going to get into a real serious corridor of the Camino Real moving up from Mexico City to El Paso along that particular route you begin to see a paved road, first a gravel road, then a paved road. Then you have to move the paved road over to where the land is flat. So from the Indian pathways to the paved trail, you begin to see something else. You begin to see a braided trail, braided well into the 20th century. One of the most important aspects of that braided trail is that it moves north into, from El Paso into New Mexico. When we take a look at the next map, you'll see something different, but we will begin to notice that on this particular braided trail, the braided trail runs from one Spanish capital to the far north capital and all capitals in between. When you take a look at what the Spanish colonial were traveling through, the land, the terrain, it wasn't easy. Oftentimes people wonder, how long did it take to use this trail from Mexico City to Santa Fe? Well, it may have taken three months, depending if you are on foot, Maybe you were making 10 to 15 miles a day. You're lucky you might make 20. If you're on horse, you might make 20 easily, uh, moving right along. But if you have a carreta caravan that's moving along with 80 caravans or maybe 130 caravans, and the caravan uh, axles are breaking and you have to camp and people are getting sick and people are getting thirsty, people have to camp and sleep and rest, you might take an extra three or four days to rest. It might take you three months to go from Mexico City to Santa Fe, New Mexico. As you take a look at the terrain of these particular lands, you'll see that it's arid. Water is a problem. And this particular Ruta de Oñate was pretty barren. He sent scouts ahead looking for water all the time. And as you take a look at the zigzaggy shots of the terrain itself, you begin to see that the land itself is very, very hostile to that kind of travel. So you begin to wonder, well, it did take three months, but what did, how did the people do it on foot, on cart, on horse, on a mule, any which way they could travel, stopping to rest, 
stopping to bury the, the, the dead, uh, stopping to cure the sick, anything you could do, maybe stopping if you found an, an Indian trail and you braided her off and you were able to find an Indian settlement, maybe you stopped to trade. So it took time to move that trail along. And as you take a look at the zigzaggy notion of having to climb a route uh, through the area of the Camino Real of the Central Corridor, it's not an easy uh, jaunt. If you take a look at the um, Rand McNally map and maybe a flight pattern, you may say, well, the Camino Real is only 1,400 miles, 1,450. But if you're going to walk it through terrain like this, maybe it's 1,600 miles. And so you're zigzagging, walking, and it's taking time for you to go across. In the first map of the Camino Real de Terra Dentro, uh, this particular map done by Enrico Martinez in 1602, is uh, showing you the first route. Down at the bottom of the map, right where you see that straight line is Mexico City. And if you look a little bit to your left, you begin to see a faded line moving up to, to Querétaro, Guanajuato, along toward a body of rivers. There's two little river lines right there. In the first exploration in New Mexico, people moved up that line and stopped at those two little rivers at the bottom. And then they followed the rivers over to the big bend, of, of near the big bend of Texas toward El Paso. And there they picked up the Rio Grande. What Juan de Oñate did, he says, we don't have the time. Uh, it's too dangerous to move across and we have to get moving and get across to the other side. So he basically bore a straight line from those two river lines straight up to the Rio Grande. That becomes the Ruta de Oñate, and it becomes the pattern of the route because he found where the water holes would be and where people could stop and rest along the route toward El Paso. As you move toward the Rio Grande, this particular map of uh, 1602 by Enrico Martinez shows where the pueblos are. It shows the Rio Grande and the Pecos River moving north. Now, if you look far to the top right-hand corner, you will notice that there are basically two, three, four, five, six rivers. The Canadian River, for example, the Red River, and then far up uh, at the very top, the Big Bend of the Arkansas. Uh, that's the area of Oklahoma and Kansas. And that was considered part of New Mexico in the 17th century. This is the land that Juan de Oñate had established and that he had explored. This particular map was not easy to make. It's made by a professional map maker who happened to not only interview people to show what the directional line was from Mexico City straight up along that fainted line, crossing those two rivers at the bottom and then moving up to the Rio Grande and into the Pueblo world was one thing. But the map was really drawn because of the exploration that Juan de Oñate did in 1601 on the Great Plains. And the map that, that this map is based on is this particular map. And you can begin to see how people began to form in their minds what a professional map would look like. From Mexico City on the left to different places like Sombrerete in the middle, and then all the way to the final circle to the far right is San Gabriel, and then a straight line that crosses the rivers over to the Great Plains and over to Oklahoma, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. When you take a look at this particular cartography, you begin to see that the Camino Real was not an easy jaunt, and it was done basically by following the memory of people who began to see something else. When you take a look at that corridor, uh, you take a look at something else. The first corridor that I had shown you on the Camino Real uh, is something else. It is a linear frontier. It is a frontier by itself with braided trails moving north. And on that frontier are people moving. They're moving language, Spanish for example, but they're also moving Nahua, the language of the Aztecs, because the Spanish are moving with Indian allies who spoke the Nahua language. They're also moving cattle, sheep, horses, mules. They're also moving the carreta, the technology of the period. They're also moving folklore. For example, uh, old almanac type of sayings uh, that you grew up hearing in English appear in the Camino Real in Spanish first. For example, cada cabeza es un mundo. Each head is its own universe. There's you and there's the other heads that you're talking to. And you come to the middle somewhere and you communicate. Cada cabeza es un mundo, each head is its own universe. You have a whole series of wise sayings that come up the Camino Real the same way. Religion came up the Camino Real. 
uh, very, very, uh, not subtly, but very aggressively because this was the, the period of the militant church and the expansion of mission programs and expansion of Roman Catholicism into the far reaches of the, of the Spanish Empire. The Camino Real is much more than a linear line. It is a linear frontier. And off to the sides, off to the branches, you begin to see something else. You begin to see spur roads that deal to other places along the way. Those places develop their own style of, of speaking Spanish. When you take a look at the Camino Real today and the Spanish that's spoken in Zacatecas compared to the dialect Spanish that's spoken in New Mexico, you begin to see that there is communication in the language, but there is a different style of speaking at the same time. There's something else about the Camino Real that we fail to recognize because our national history tends to portray that the first unit of democracy was the New England Town Meeting in 1620, that the first unit of democracy is the House of Burgesses in Virginia in 1619. And you begin to see that uh, democracy spreads from there, from English America to all parts. Yet we fail to see that along the Camino Real, governance is another issue that is developed along the route. Spanish sovereignty, Spanish governance. When you take a look at what happens here, the New England town meeting is nothing more than elected officials and appointed officials who tend to come to a meeting in the town to decide what the issues are. The Spanish cabildo, which is based on Greco-Roman tradition, spread throughout Europe and spread to England. The town meeting house is very, very common throughout Europe. Spain introduced the cabildo at Santo Domingo, uh, the um, Dominican Republic today, uh, in 1508. If you go there, you'll see the, the Cabildo house, the Cabildo structure, the building, and the, one of the first Cabildo uh, alcalde mayores, or mayors, the city mayor of the Cabildo was Christopher Columbus's son. When you take a look at the founding of Capara in, in Puerto Rico, the Cabildo was established at Capara in 1508. When you take a look at the Cabildo that is established in Mexico City, 1525, in San Agustin, Florida, 1565, in Cuba, Havana, Cuba, 1518, New Mexico, 1598. That's long before the, the House of Burgesses in 1619, long before the New England town meeting. And you have something else that's really very fascinating about New Mexico's Camino Real. It ends in Santa Fe, starting in 1610. The Palace of the Governors is created, it is built, it is constructed, and in it is housed the Cabildo with the, with the Alcalde Mayor, the mayor. And in that Cabildo of Santa Fe, it runs from basically 1610 in that same spot to the Roundhouse today. It runs in the Palace of the Governors where it was housed from 1610 to about probably the, 50, the uh, 1890s, right about to around statehood. Then it is moved into some other area of Santa Fe and finally becomes the roundhouse. It moved 10 blocks. Compare the Cabildo of Texas, which was moved because of the Mexican vote, uh, was too powerful, they moved it to Austin. They moved the Cabildo of Tucson, Arizona to the prefab town of Phoenix. They moved the Cabildo of Monterrey to somewhere in Sacramento on the plains. Yet in New Mexico, we have the tradition of having kept the Cabildo in the same place in the Camino Real where it was established. So it's very important to note that these particular maps uh, are very functional, very, very important to note because they tell the history of a braided trail. They tell the history of a place that had become a linear frontier with its own culture that developed straight up and down with the same basically folklore, the same music. There's something fascinating else you know, in our national history, we talk about Johnny Appleseed. And Walt Disney made that famous cartoon and everyone loved it. And we all say the apples got here because our national story says that the English brought her across and the apples are established. Along the Camino Real, Juan de Oñate, whose name is Juan, and sometimes referred to as Juanito, which means Johnny, the first Johnny Appleseed was Juan de Oñate because in 1598 they brought apples into New Mexico. Not only did they bring apples, they brought chili. The Pueblo Indians are known by archaeologists not to have had chili. Chili is an Aztec type of product and it came up to Camino Real 
And now today we have all types of green and red that we can enjoy. One of the products of the Camino Real along with this music and it's part of the heritage. So what is a Camino Real? If you have all kinds of spur roads and roads moving in all directions, why is the Camino Real different? Well, you think of the Roman Appian Way, they had a protected road. And what does protection mean? We'll come to that in a minute. But when you take a look at the idea of a royal road, is it royal or what is it? What is it that makes it distinct from a trail that runs from, from say, Albuquerque to Santa Fe, and all of a sudden branches off uh, to Galisteo? Is the Galisteo a Camino Real, or is the Camino Real the one road? The one important distinction is this, that the Camino Real is based on certain criteria of law. The Le Jusco, for example, uh, in the medieval period, the Jusco Real, the Siete Partidas, these are volumes of laws that quantify and also identify what the legal status of a right-of-way is and what a passageway is. You have the Recopilacion de Leyes de Indias in the 1680s, a huge accumulation of medieval to modern day laws of that particular period. Then you have the Novissima Recopilacion in 1805, which continues to define what is royal. What is the word royal? And it comes from the Latin regalis, which is regalia in Spanish. Uh, the regalias were actually charters which were given to individuals or to towns, the town charter that you hear so much about given to an individual. If you were an individual and they gave you a regalia, that is, the king did, which would be a statement of real, real meaning the royal privilege, and the word privilege is very important here. When you take a look at the idea that I, the king, give you a document that says you have the right to travel this route and you will be protected no matter what, and you will be free from paying tolls, then what does is, what is the real mean? It means that wherever I go, wherever I stop to camp, that is the real. But that is ephemeral. That is for the time being. But the real is where I finally establish the royal place. Albuquerque was a real. Santa Fe was the real. It had the town charter. It had the documentation. El Paso was the real. Ciudad Chihuahua was the real. Zacatecas. So from place to place. A real is, not, is, not, is only given to the capital area of a given place, of a given region. It is not given to an Indian town. It is not given to a common Spanish village. It is where the line of march is, and that's a protected road. So what do we mean by protected road? On the other side of the coin, we say, we say oh, we see the military, a garrison, soldiers on horses marching up and down, protecting you against thieves. Mm, that's true. And you have a convoy coming up with a guard you have a caravan coming up with a guard, that's a protected road. But there's something else along this protected road, and that is if you are a herder, if you are moving cattle from one place to the other, and you have the real document with you, you cannot be charged for the town, by the town, for water. You cannot be charged for pasturage. You cannot be charged for wood. You have the right and the transit right to go right through and carry your goods forward. If you're a merchant, the same thing. You have the various laws that were created even as early as Queen Isabel uh, when uh, she established a, an organization uh, for um, carreteros. And the, uh, the idea that these people who had carts in Spain could move from one place to the other without being charged a toll. That law passed into the Americas once the Spanish government was established. You have the Mesta, which had to do with herding, sheep herders, goat herders, cattle herders, horse, mule, whatever, oxen. They had the right to pass through a town if they had the real with them without being charged. In 1734, Jose de Acevedo was moving cattle toward Mexico City when he was stopped at several towns and charged money to pass through their town carrying just a small herd of cattle and he was carrying this herd of cattle, moving this herd of cattle to the market. What happened in the place is that he had to go to the Viceroy once he got to Mexico City, and he had to establish a legal case and charge the towns for having abused his right to the real. So the real really is a privilege. I often wonder, Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, 
This is the Royal Road of the Interior. The Royal Road of the Interior. We always use the word Royal, but really it should be the privileged road of the interior. Arreal is the privilege that's given to you by law to pass through this area, being protected not only militarily, but also protected against the mayors of the town who are going to charge you for passing through their town. So the protected road has to be in that, in that particular, viewed in that particular uh, passageway of the right to go through a town without being charged or without being abused. When you take a look at the Camino Real de Terra Dentro, we began to see that it is the interior road of the interior, Tierra Adentro. Right around Zacatecas, the road spurs off to the east and goes to Saltillo, and Saltillo, Mexico rather, and toward the Rio Grande and crosses into Texas, goes past uh, San Antonio to Louisiana. That became the Camino Real de Tierra, uh, the Tierra Afuera, the Royal Road of the Outside, the Exterior Road. The, the Royal Road of the Interior, the Camino Real de Tierra Dentro, the Camino Real de Tierra Afuera, the Royal Road of the Exterior. And so, before long, you have a Royal Road that ends up with the establishment of San Antonio, Texas, in around 1716, 1712, 1716, 1720. You have missions established there, you have forts established there, and so on. Trade is happening on the Camino Real. Something else happens on the Camino Real and this braided trail. You have a young Hispanic male, or you have a young Aztec type uh, male, sees this cute Zacatecan female. What happens? They marry, they have children. What is changing? The DNA changes on the Camino Real as you move northward. Pretty much like it has on any single historical trail, including the silk trade route from China to Afghanistan, to Russia, to the Mediterranean. The same thing happens there as happens on the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. When you take a look at the Camino Real de California, which now brings me to a very important point. When we were working with the U.S. Congress on the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, I got a phone call from some guy, some historical, historical society person in California, saying, you have to stop this. I said, why? He said, because the only Camino Real is the Camino Real de California. And I said, well, I hate to tell you this, but the Camino Real de, de la Ruta de Oñate was established in 1598. And the original Camino Real runs its course from 1540 for about almost 60 years before Oñate crosses, in, crosses the Rio Grande. The Ruta de California is established in 1769. The Ruta that's established in Saltillo and uh, and uh, going up into the San Antonio area, is established right around 1575, 1690, depending on which state you want to use for the actual real usage. So the Camino Real, there's all kinds of Caminos Reales in Sonora, for example, in Coahuila, in Chihuahua, uh, moving northward into the area of present United States. The Camino Real de Terra Dentro is important because it established the governance, and it is the governance that we see today uh, we still see representation, Hispanic representation, on the governance established at the Cabildo, running to the Ayuntamiento, running into the uh, territorial legislature, and running into statehood where we have the Roundhouse. New Mexicans have been involved in that particular governance of New Mexico since the very beginning. And the Camino Real is part of that story, and vice versa. That story of governance is part of the history and heritage of the Camino Real de Terra Dentro.